Coming up next is a keynote session by Mr. Sanjeev Bikchandani, Founder and Executive Vice Chairman, InfoEdge India Limited. Welcome Mr. Bikchandani, pleasure to have you here. Please take over. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, just a few bullet points. I began my career in 1984 in advertising in Lintas as a client servicing trainee, and I was there for three years. Post my MBA, I worked for two years in consumer marketing in a company that is now called GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, then it was called HMM. Uh, I was working on the brand Holics. Now, that was my grounding in consumer brands, brand building, and uh, all other associated stuff, including advertising. So 37 years later, 38 years later, when I look back and I think, uh, and a very fundamental question, uh, how are brands built? And it's always been said by ad agencies and by advertising professionals, by your traditional marketing companies, that brands are built by advertising. I'd like to challenge that notion just a wee bit. According to me, brands are built by consumer experience and by word of mouth, what the customer experiences, what he feels about the brand, and what he says about it, he or she. Advertising is merely an accelerator. Advertising will make a good product succeed faster. It'll make a bad product fail faster, in my view. So if brands are built by word of mouth, if brands are built by consumer experience, uh, then an advertising only comes afterwards when you've got a good product and you've got a good product market fit, when you're solving an unsolved problem for a consumer, then what becomes the role of advertising and what becomes the role of product development in the case of digital products or platforms, uh, you know, user experience, UI, UX, uh, uh, engineering, technology, uh, all of those things become very important in brand building. So, so a brand uh, perception, a brand image, uh, what the consumer thinks of a brand is actually uh, you know, influenced by a very large number of touch points that the consumer may have with the brand. Very often not influenced by communication from the manufacturer or the marketer. So communication from Manufacturers and marketers is only one out of maybe 20 or 30 touch points that a consumer has with the brand. So in that sense, it becomes really important to influence to the extent possible the other touch points and experiences and in order to get the right brand image perception, brand preference in the consumer's mind. And marketers will have to, I think, increasingly devote more and more time and attention all touch points rather than just the touch points where they are communicating to the consumer through paid advertising. Now, having said this, um, I look back on our experience in Nokri. I look back on Zomato's experience. I look back on uh, the experience of various other businesses we've either run or we've invested behind. The first insight I'd like to provide is that successful brands, successful businesses are built on deep customer insights. Deep customer insights about what? Deep customer insights about perhaps an unsolved problem, a gap in the market, an unmet need of the consumer. And if you solve, then you produce a product that solves the problem, addresses that need, and that is when you possibly have the beginnings of a successful business. So. I remember meeting Deepinder Goyal for the first time. Uh, Deepinder is the founder of Zomato, as you're aware. Uh, I remember meeting him for the first time in uh, June 2010. I had reached out to him saying, let's meet. I did not know him from before. It was a cold call, and we met up. Now, Zomato was a site which was then called Foodie Bay, which I was using, which is H. Oberoi, our CEO, uh, co-promoter, he was using. Uh, and he takes this to me that why don't you look at uh, Zamato or Foodie Bay to invest behind? And that's how I reached out to Dipinder. 
But the great thing about Foodie Bay uh, was that while there were several restaurant listing sites, this is the only site with all the menu cards. What it meant was that you could actually see the restaurant page, go there uh, to the page, see the menu card, see what dishes are available, at what price, compare it with other restaurants, uh, which you, and then decide where to go to. And for me, that was very useful. Hitesh found it useful too. Other sites had reviews, they had photographs, they had community, but they did not have the menu cards. So when I met Dipinder for the first time, I asked him, I asked him, Ye, ye idea kahan se aya? where did you get the idea from? And he said, he told me a very interesting story, and I've said it before several times. He told me a very interesting story. Uh, he said that he was working in Bain Consulting uh, in Gurgaon. Uh, maybe he joined there one year out of IID, Delhi. And uh, he, Bain was an office in Gurgaon where there were maybe 50 or 60 people, mostly young, mostly male, mostly single, many living away from their hometowns in Gurgaon. What this meant was that they would not bring food from home. Office hours were long, working hours were long, consulting you know, drives you hard. So you invariably ended up eating two meals in the office, lunch and dinner. Office had a cafeteria, uh, but it would not serve food. You had to get your own food and eat it there, if you wished. Now, to make life easy for the employees, the admin team had put, had compiled uh, the delivery menus of maybe 70 or 80 restaurants that would deliver to that location. And they had kept them in a file folder uh, in the cafeteria. It was a shared resource. You could not take it to your desk. And Dipinder told me, listen, at 1 p.m., there's a long line to access that folder. You get it for two and a half minutes. You wait 20 minutes you, to get it. And then you quickly call up the restaurant and you place your order and you come back in 45 minutes when it's delivered. You come back to eat it. And he said, look, I was busy. Uh, I was hungry. I didn't have time. So it was a huge pain to do it in this manner. So one weekend he came in and he scanned all those menu, menu, menu cards and he uploaded all the scans on his personal page on the office intranet. And within two days, the IT infra guy came to him and said, what have you done? Why is 95% of internal traffic going to your page? And he said the penny dropped. I realized that aggregation of menu cards has got value, not just for myself, but for everybody else too. So there may be a product and business idea here. And with his uh, CEO's permission to work on a personal project, he began to go out on weekends and holidays to restaurants all over Delhi NCR and pick up their delivery menu cards. And once he had 800, he launched the site Foodie Bay and instantly traffic began to come because he had solved a pain point. He had identified, on a, he had got a customer insight from the, from the conduct of his, of his colleagues. He had got a customer insight uh, as to what an unfulfilled need is and he fulfilled it. And when he did that, uh, traffic began to come and he said, hey, I'm onto something. Now, a very simple insight that aggregation of menu cards has got value. It's something which anybody else would have done, but the truth is nobody did it because they did not have the insight. Now, when you solve somebody's unsolved problem and people are happy with you, you are building brand, right? Now, this is not yet digital marketing. This is simply putting together a product or service, a compilation of restaurant listing with menu cards, using digital technology on the internet to solve somebody's unsolved problem just one example. But once you've got the product market fit, which you got, that is when you use further aspects of the digital ecosystem to build your business further, right? So at Nokri, we advertise on TV, we advertise online, we advertise. But the truth is that what we have any, what the innovations we have done on product on technology, on engineering, on algorithms, on AI, on machine learning. Those have done more for the business and the brand uh, than merely advertising has. So advertising comes after doing all that. 
alongside, but it builds on that. Right? Have you ever seen a Google ad? I am not sure Google has ever advertised in its life, either on TV or digitally. Yet it's built a very powerful brand. I haven't seen too many Facebook ads either. A very powerful brand. I'm not sure Twitter spent a lot of money on advertising. So point is that can you use aspects of the digital ecosystem to make your product or service go viral uh, so as to minimize your marketing expenditure for on paid ads uh, so as to make your company succeed and your brand powerful. If you can, uh, it's a good thing. If you build a network effect, you build a moat. That's a good thing. And all of these are possible on the digital ecosystem without spending a whole ton of money in the traditional way on TV advertising or press advertising or mass media advertising. So if you look at the digital sort of ecosystem and you, let's start with digital advertising. If you look at digital advertising, uh, I think there are a few aspects of digital advertising uh, which are unique and interesting. Right? The first thing is it's very many types of digital ads. They are divisible in terms of how much money you want to spend uh, and how much impressions or click-throughs you want to suit your pocket. You can do experiments at low cost to figure out what works. You can measure response. You can see the math, right? Now, none of this uh, has been available in the traditional media of uh, of, of, of television or print advertising. And to that extent, uh, you know, digital advertising offers huge advantages of measurability, accountability, of divisibility as compared to uh, traditional media. Now, none of this really mattered in a significant manner until there was enough penetration of uh, the mobile phone, of internet, of computers in the population. And really it's about mobile phones more than anything else and mobile telephony and data access, right? The other aspect of uh, digital advertising and digital communication is that depending on how you device it, it, it can be interactive, which means it's no longer one-way communication. You are saying something, the consumer is talking back to you. The consumer is part of the conversation. Traditional advertising, the consumer was now part of the conversation. The consumer was always spoken to. He could not answer back or she could not answer back. Now, the digital platforms have enabled the consumer to talk back to the company and to talk to each other, more importantly. So very often, you are not in the conversation, but consumers are talking about you. Online, digital, social media, right? Uh, and that makes a huge difference. So increasingly marketers have and business businesses have got less influence on what is being spoken about about them as compared to earlier uh, and i think that sort of thing um, keeps marketers and businesses perhaps more honest and that's a good thing right the other significant thing about digital advertising is that small businesses can also do it. To go on TV, to produce a commercial, to have a national campaign uh, requires a certain minimum budget. And that minimum budget is very often out of the reach of small companies. But in digital, uh, you can do it much cheaper. You can do it much, much smaller budget. You can, you can scale up your ad budget, your communication expense as you go along, right? You've also, a lot of it is not about paid advertising alone, where you're paying the website where you're advertising or the app where you're advertising or the platform where you're advertising. Very often, it's about influencers, it's about communities, it's about social media marketing. Some of it is free, some of it is paid for. But uh, if you're entrepreneurial enough, if you're smart enough as a small business person, as a marketer, uh, you can do a lot more with a lot less money than before. And so this democratization of marketing is, uh, I think, a very significant uh, development in the digital ecosystem, which means that a lot of young companies, a lot of startups, a lot of small companies, and may not be startups, uh, if they're smart, they can also take advantage of this, which they are. And today we've got tens of thousands of startups that are coming up and more and more are coming up every year. Uh, I'm not sure how many of them would be able to acquire customers had it not been for the, the digital ecosystem. 
if I look at some of the, you know, now we started in Naukri in 1997. So it's been, what, uh, 25 years since then? So 25 years of Naukri. Um, things have changed a lot. When we launched Naukri, there were only, uh, I think, 15 or 14,000 internet accounts in the country, uh, which shared accounts that made about 200,000 users. Today, you're talking about a few hundred million users. Right? Uh, so the market is real. I think if I look back on what it was like 25 years ago, there was no venture capital, no risk capital, no angel money. Uh, you know, we were among the first to do it. So they weren't really success stories before us whom we could talk to, emulate. They weren't that many mentors. They weren't um, ecosystems like uh, like Thai. Uh, they weren't angel networks. None of, none of that existed. So we were kind of doing it with customer money and doing it on our own and figuring it out. Today, I think uh, the ecosystem has evolved greatly for entrepreneurs, for startups, uh, and uh, on digital platforms, on availability of data, on mobile phones. Uh, you know, uh, none of these things were around then or to the extent that they are today. So I think uh, these are some of the big factors that have uh, influenced the rise of this ecosystem. And it seems to be now very large and uh, all pervasive and probably unstoppable, right? Now, when I look ahead, and I'm not a real uh, very good forecaster what's going to happen because things are moving so fast in so many different directions. But I think increasingly you're going to see more and more AI, more and more machine learning, the metaverse, uh, new technologies evolving, you know, higher bandwidth availability in the hands of the consumer. Uh, I think you're going to see rural markets open up. They already have to some extent. More of that will happen. Right? I think you're going to see digital impacting sections of the economy and sections of society and populations where it seemed most unlikely to reach maybe as recently as five years ago. Right? So I see an increasingly digital world. I see old economy organizations. I see the traditional media uh, evolving to harness this. Uh, I see younger people coming into uh, businesses doing startups uh, because really the people who are older, above 30, above 40, above 50, they probably are not digitally native. When I say digitally native, I mean they did not grow up with the internet. They were not born with the internet. Uh, they discovered it with their teens or later. I saw the internet for the first time when I was 33 years old. So clearly I'm not digitally native. My children are. Right? So they are using platforms which I have downloaded on my mobile phone, but I rarely use. I am not, I'm not millennial. So increasingly you're going to find that people who understand the millennials, understand the next generation and next next generation, they will use digital better. What this also means is that traditional companies which are staffed by older people uh, will have to get enough young people, very young people on board uh, in order to evolve because it's very hard for a 55 year old, I'm 58 right now, 58 year old to actually become this king of Instagram. I'm not that guy. So increasingly I see young people coming into companies, organizations, young people doing startups that disrupt. Uh, and it'll be a very different business landscape, uh, maybe 20 years from now. So when I look back, uh, when I took up my first job in 1984, uh, I was 21 then. It was a very different environment. Uh, I remember there was a, there was an eight year waiting list to get a gas connection. There was no mobile telephony. There was a eight year waiting list to get a landline. There was a 17 year waiting list to get a Bajaj scooter. It was an environment of scarcity. It was dominated by the public sector, at least in Delhi and government. Uh, and now things are very different. And if I look back these 37 years, 38 years, uh, I think a lot of things have changed and they've not changed suddenly, they've evolved, but it has, over, but they have really changed. So if you, if you look back, if I look back on all the industries and companies and sectors that have created growth, buzz, uh, employment, uh, attracted investment, very few of these companies and industries even existed in 1984. IT services barely existed. IT enabled services did not exist. 
private sector airlines did not exist. A private sector banks uh, did not really exist. Private sector insurance companies did not exist. Mobile telephony did not exist. Internet companies did not exist. Mobile uh, app companies did not exist. So if you look at sector after sector after sector, industry after industry, which has actually given growth and buzz and employment and investment in the last 35, 37 years, it did not exist at that time when I began my career. So what will happen 20 years from now? I cannot say. But I can say it will be very different from what it is today. And it will be driven by entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs, by technology and by capital. So I can't really say what will happen, but I know it will be different from today. I'll stop here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bikchandani, for all the necessary information and useful content. Now we'll move to the next session. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen.